Hello everyone, Stealthy Unknown here, and by popular demand, we're covering the force reset trigger in today's video. The eagle eyed among you might have noticed the date that this video is posted. It is not an accident, I did that deliberately. May 19th, 1986. It's the date that the Hughes Amendment to the NFA was passed. And what the Hughes Amendment did was ban civi civilian sale and possession of automatic weapons. However, you can still buy and sell machine guns in the US. They are just manufactured and registered with the ATF before May 19, 1986. We'll talk about what the consequences of that are later and what we can do about it. At the start of the video, what we're going to get into here in a second, we're going to talk about a few things we've covered in previous videos just to give a refresher or just to bring to light some mechanical concepts that will be necessary to be understood before we move on to force reset triggers and how they work. From there we'll move on to my personal design for a forced reset trigger and explain how that works and where the inspiration for that came from. Then we'll talk about some ideas, some components that have been floating around for a very long time and which I have caught wind of years ago. I want to say about 2010, 11, 12 ish. I actually thought of a force reset trigger. It was an idea that I had in my head and I simply didn't pursue it because at the time the ATF was doing their fiasco about bump stocks and I figured well if they're gonna be that way about bump stocks then they're probably not gonna be very receptive to force reset triggers which are in some regards a step up from bump stocks in regards to their capacity to replicate automatic fire and last but not least for those who are interested we will talk about the politics philosophy legal troubles of force reset triggers, automatic weapons, firearms in general, whether or not they're suitable for civilian ownership or not, and some things we can do to go forward in our society in a way that might benefit people in general. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk about some of these core concepts that are necessary to understand. We'll start with a standard mil-spec AR-15 fire control grip, fire control group with a semi-automatic fire control group. So you have your trigger, you have your disconnector, you have your hammer, you have your selector, and you have your bolt. Technically your bolt carrier, but I'll call it a bolt just for simplicity. When you press the trigger, you're basically turning the trigger into something like a wheel leverage this way rotates the whole trigger so the front of it comes down moves out of the way of the hammer allowing the hammer to drop when it does it hits the firing pin causing the gun to cycle when I'm pressing the trigger and holding it when the gun cycles the disconnector which is spring loaded rotates slightly out of the way when it contacts the hammer allowing the hammer to snap onto it the shape here is important because that means that these surfaces are going to tend towards each other and uh, won't slip. The, the, sh the shapes and proportions do matter. What happens as a result of those shapes and proportions is the hammer is held ever so slightly more rearward than it would be if it were on the trigger. So when you release the trigger, it and the disconnector both rotate to the rear which allows the hammer to walk from the disconnector to the trigger like that and obviously when it's in safe that whitened uh, block right there blocks the trigger from moving it's a very simple safety from there automatic fire and we have these back view cutaways to help demonstrate a few things it's not much of a step up from 
semi-automatic. You still have your safety. You still have your disconnector, your hammer, your trigger, your bolt. However, you also have this auto sear right here, and you might notice some things have a few different shapes. So, for example, there's a tail on this disconnector, but this connector had its tail cut off. What's actually going on here is the disconnector has an extension on the back of it that allows it to interface with the selector axle. So that when you set it to full auto, so you see the red tab on the selector here, presses down on the disconnector preventing it from moving. And when it does that, the blue tab also, or rather the cutout where the blue tab is, also allows this tail of the auto sear to rotate forward so that it can catch the hammer on this extra shelf. And it holds it like that until the bolt is closed. This is traditionally a safety device. This is to keep the gun from shooting out of battery. All the selector does really is enable or disable either the disconnector or the trigger and it blocks the auto sear less for the functionality because you can run semi-automatic with a disc with a full auto sear it makes no difference all it does is prevents you from shooting out a battery like I said the reason it closes it though so when the bolt is rearward notice the safety restricts that auto sear now it moves no it doesn't the reason it does that is if you've ever seen somebody assemble an AR-15, you know you know the upper receiver closes down onto the lower. And these components right here are in the lower receiver, but the bolt is in the upper. So it has to come down on top of the auto sear. And if it's like this, when you close it, it's just going to come down on top of that part of the auto sear, which is not ideal. It might cause damage or just prevents you from closing it all the way. And if you force it shut, you might cause damage or jam your gun up. Automatic fire is very simple. You're more the auto sear is kind of like a disconnector that's independent of the trigger. Instead, it's released, so to say, by the bolt itself, by this shelf on the back of it. Moving onward, well, I'll show you one more thing real quick. Notice that this kind of resembles a finger, and when it's pressing, it can stay put and it'll just keep shooting. This is important, I want you to take note of this. So when we get to a force reset trigger, you notice that though it does something similar, like it keeps shooting and shooting, notice that finger moves back and forth. This is critical to the legality of the force reset trigger under our current unconstitutional NFA legislation. So what's going on here, you know, there's actually not a lot going on here. You have your trigger, which has a different shape. You have your hammer, which has a different shape. And you have this little piece here, which is your locking bar. And this, is, this will tie into something we're going to talk about later when I discuss how I've known about force reset triggers for a long while, probably 10 years now. I just never pursued them because I never thought it worth it. So what's going on here is when the hammer gets cocked by the bolt, you'll notice it wants to press on the top of the trigger there. It's this hump here, right? It actually forces the trigger forward, hence the term forced reset. By pressure of the bolt carrier moving back and pressing the hammer down, the trigger is forced forward. When the trigger is forced forward, the end of it presses down and out of the way of the locking bar. And the locking bar holds it there until the bolt is closed. These are very simple triggers, but they accomplish a very difficult and demanding task under the current litigation, which is if you want cyclic rate of fire, how can you do that? without doing it in a way that you can hold the trigger to do. That is to say, like like a machine gun where you just hold the trigger down. In this sense, you're, you're still in a sense holding the trigger down. However, the letter of the law is approached differently here. 
So the letter of the law dictates that something's a machine gun when it can allow a firearm to fire, or when it is a firearm that can fire more than one round of ammunition without manual reloading per function of the trigger. So when the ATF says a function of a trigger, they mean hit or release. In this case, release is done automatically by the forced reset. This is clever in multiple ways because this solves the machine gun conundrum problem. It's not a machine gun anymore because it's not firing more than one round per function of the trigger. It's actually firing one round per two functions of the trigger, hit and, in this case, automatic release. So this is a very simple force reset trigger. It's the OG provided by Rare Breed Triggers. They're the company that's in hot water right now with the AFT. They're going after them and telling them cease and desist, stop making them, stop selling them. And for the uh, rare breed company is like, no, fuck you, we're going to go to court. It's an interesting story and I'd like to see how it develops. But using this knowledge that you see here, we're going to move on towards my offering. Also, I'll pause the video and read some of these if you want. Here's my personal offering. You see, imagine you're looking at this trigger pack from the back. This is what you see. It's your selector axle. This is that bar that you see going across right here in red. So I'm talking about this bar right here. It's orange here because in the FRT position, which is like full auto, so here, it's orange because it's pressing back on this piece. This is the plate or the disconnector. It's also a combination disconnector forced reset component because as you see right here it has this little ledge hammer presses on that. The shape is a little bit weird and it's a little thin here because very small tolerances I have to work with. You have to press it back to install the selector axle like you see there. So it's not a lot of room to work with. This is how mil spec triggers are. Safety, this bar blocks the trigger and the disconnector technically. In this mode, there's really nothing to block it. So the disconnector under spring pressure, notice it rocks forward and back like that instead of rotating, it wants to catch the hammer like you see there but instead of rotating out of the way like the other one does it slides out of the way and under spring pressure when the hammers past it it returns and catches it when you let the trigger off it uh, resets nothing unusual really out of the normal here besides the particular motion the disconnector accomplishes this with but if you notice when I throw the selector another 90 degrees that bar that runs across it presses on the back of the disconnector and now what happens is something completely different the hammer suddenly hits the dis disconnector in a totally different spot while missing it on its semi-automatic semi catch now it is a forced reset trigger and this extension on the back of it is what's caught, caught by the locking bar this was inspired in part by somebody by the name of or a channel on YouTube by the name of Hoffman Tactical and he has a 3D printed insert sort of like this for an AR-15 trigger that with the combination of his 3D printed block gives you a force reset trigger so the uh, plate that he installs takes the place of a disconnector and instead it's just kind of this straight cut arm the back of the trigger presses on the uh, locking bar and everything else is of course normal. He uses a mil-spec trigger and hammer like I do here. But uh, yeah, notice this also does the bouncing back and forth bit, so it is not a machine gun. And the ATF can continue to try to fight the American people on this one. They're not going to win. And the harder they push, the more they're going to get kicked in return. My suggestion to the AFT, settle down. You don't have the deference on this. You're wrong. You've been wrong. 
and the legislation has been wrong ever since the start. And I do, by and large, have a lot of supporters in that regard in the ATF itself, and I owe them respect because they, they're doing what they can. But there's a lot of politics in these bureaucracies, and there's a lot of people who, though they mean well, do the wrong thing. And so this is the part of the video where we talk a bit about the philosophy of firearms and all that. I'm going to try to make it brief because this video is going to already run past 20 minutes if I'm not careful. Probably already has. I'm not watching the clock. Uh, but yeah, the question, should civilians have firearms? Just firearms in general. We'll, just, we'll expand on machine guns and all that in a moment. Uh, it's a dangerous proposition. There's lots of places in the world where it's not allowed. I would argue the U.S. does it well in spite of all the terrible news you hear. It's actually very peaceful to live here if you don't live here. By and large, you don't really see much violence. There's people being petty. And the sort of stuff people tend to do with each other it, everywhere. You get some of that here, but you also have enough people carrying here in many places that people tend to be more respectful and mind their own business than I've seen in other countries. You're not going to be harassed here in the U.S. out of nowhere. Like, you're going to... The people that harass you, you're going to know a little bit for sure. Generally speaking, at least. Like, a stranger isn't going to harass you. And I've been in other, other countries where strangers do come up and harass you. They have no consequences. What are you going to do about it? You can't shoot them. Here in the U.S., you know, that's as wrong as it would be to shoot somebody for just harassing you. It's something the harasser has to consider before they do what they do. So regarding the law on forced reset triggers, they're firing once per function of the trigger, and by that definition, they are not machine guns. However... We'll address the elephant in the room and talk about the fact that they do allow you to fire at the cyclic rate or very close to the secret late sick English cyclic rate of the firearm that they're installed into. And that's true. They do allow you to shoot fast in some regard. They as fast as the gun can run. In fact, there's some force reset triggers that just the way they're timed or like the reduced strain they place on the action just run a little bit faster than a full auto but it shouldn't matter the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed that wasn't up for debate it isn't up for discussion it isn't up for yeah but as we've done with the NFA in general we can't keep giving corporate or government bureaucracies the right to deference to say hey we know the law says this but we don't fucking care we're just gonna do things our way it, do it doesn't work that way and we're gonna really create a lot of problems for the country if we continue to operate as if that's how it goes we're, we're essentially undermining ourselves and our uh, As a, as a nation, we're undermining our own uh, sovereignty as individuals in the country by giving so much power and deference to corporate and government entities. And like I said, like the ATF isn't all bad. There's good people in it, and by and large, th there are times they do stop very dangerous people. But at the same time, the precedence it sets regarding the law is a very dangerous one. And I want us to be very careful when we write one thing into the Constitution and make it very clear that there's really no room for interpretation. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's plain English. A child can understand that. You know, that, that isn't a rated... That's, that's PG at the most. Just get with it. It's simple. And it's difficult because uh, a lot of people 
are very compelled by the idea that really people shouldn't have guns. They generally don't need them. And by and large, that's somewhat true. In your average everyday experience here in the U.S. or just anywhere in the world, you're probably not going to need a gun. But we don't wear our seatbelt because we get into an accident every time we get into the car, do we? We wear a seatbelt for the one time, the one off time where things go sideways. Because we know that it'll be better for us to wear it if things go sideways. We're not anticipating, you know, getting to an accident. You put a seatbelt on, you don't even think about it. It's second nature. Unless you're dumb and you don't, which by all means you do you. But guns are really no different. Guns are just a safety device that happens to be a safety from other human beings, meaning they cause you harm. Whether they're military, whether they're police, whether they're insurgents, whether they're ordinary people, criminals, gangsters, it doesn't matter. If somebody's in the wrong and they have it out for you, you as an individual have the existential right to exert physical violence if necessary to ensure your own continuity. It's a guaranteed fundamental human right. If you exist, you have the right to your claws and your teeth. However, those happen to manifest in your case. If in your case it means you're throwing lead stones at 2500 feet per second, so be it. Nobody not any institution, neither government nor other people, have the right under the Second Amendment to tell you you don't have a right to something. It's nobody else's business what you choose to defend your life with, or defend your assets, or your property, or your family. It doesn't matter. If you deem it as necessary, if you take comfort in owning whatever it is you decide to own that is your responsibility and you are charged with that responsibility and the discipline that comes with that ownership that is your responsibility it's not the government's place to make sure you're taken care of and educated and properly trained and all that they don't do that for everything else in your life why should you expect them to do that with your defense and think of this for a moment how how selfish, stupid, and naive do you have to be to forgo your own responsibility for self-preservation and defer it on to another human being and say, this is your job, put your life on the line to defend mine. There's nothing more selfish and self-absorbed than that. Am I grateful that we have SWAT? and the military branches and police officers who frequently go do these things yeah absolutely I'm glad they're necessary I'm glad we have them but at the same time it's selfish of me to expect them to be there and do that I, ho I hope I'm making sense when I'm talking about this because it's it's simple to me. It makes sense. You know, if I were a police officer and somebody assumed it's my job to stack my body in their defense, you know, I'd be a little offended by that. And I think really it isn't a police officer's job to stack their bodies on defending you. We should be grateful that they often do it. but it's not expected. Anyway, I'm gonna show you a couple pictures and uh, we'll leave it at that. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, leave questions and comments in the uh, comment section below. Thanks for watching. Hey, just a short bit here at the end about uh, what I was talking about earlier regarding some inspiration that I had 
when I uh, some of the materials I came across that inspired me to think of a force reset trigger years ago. Obviously, the force reset trigger came out last year by uh, Rare Breed. It's probably been an idea that's covered, been at least you know thought of and toyed around with over the years. Like I said, they made the Tacon 3MR trigger, which uses a forced reset effect to help encourage reset. There's no locking bar like there is with the true force reset trigger, so it's, it's a bit different, but the concept's been toyed with for a while. But I want you to take a look here. Like We've been staring at this for a minute now. I'm going to go ahead and circle the component in question. It's a locking bar. And what I mean by locking bar is... I was playing around with this program one day, and this, this program, if you were curious, is called Gun Disassembly 2 on mobile, or uh, World of Guns. You can look those up on Google if you'd like. And I was playing around with the STG-44 that you see here, and I noticed that there was a part that engaged with the bolt. But it didn't seem to do anything when firing, and that was curious to me. Whenever I see a part that taking up space and it isn't doing anything I get curious what could it be doing and so I investigated further and I tried moving the action without firing so like you see here towards the front you see a live round being pulled out that's because I'm just pulling the action back now you see the very back end of the locking bar now is moved and it's pressing down into the back end of the trigger it clicked to me that this was a locking bar for the trigger and prevented you from pulling the trigger when it's out of battery. So couple of this with another phenomenon that I've been made aware of over the years, which is trigger slap. Which, if you didn't know, trigger slap is a uh, it's a common problem among low end production quality AKs, where the fitment of various fire control components can be a little sloppy at times and the problem with some of these components was on certain receivers or certain components in conjunction with each other would cause the hammer to either engage with the trigger or the disconnector very violently and cause it to slap forward into the finger of the shooter this is generally a bad thing and causes damage on general you know standard AK components that weren't designed to have trigger slap but back in the day when I encountered both of these two things I uh, put two and two together and I thought well if you use trigger slap deliberately and you add a locking bar to keep the trigger held forward until the bolt closes wouldn't that sort of be like a machine gun without actually legally being a machine gun well, I didn't pursue it back in the day because the ATF was going after bump stocks and I was right in assuming that they would be very much the same with this thing. But to give credit to rare breed triggers and credit to all the true red-blooded Americans that live here in the U.S., I want to say that kind of for all of us, we don't give a fuck what the ATF thinks anymore. 